Good morning, church. Welcome to Franklin Community Church. The pastor is in the house. I'm just up in the balcony, but uh, there's a reason for that. But uh, welcome to the church service this morning, and I want to share a couple announcements. Uh, first off, right after the service this morning, we're going to unhang the greens. I know many of you have taken down your decorations in your home, but now it's time to take down the decorations in our church home. So if you can stick around after the service, that would be appreciated. Next Sunday is our annual chili soup cook-off. Uh, that's always a fun event. We have a sign-up sheet in Cyril's Hall. So all you cooks, get out your uh, recipes for your chili and soup. I know it's a very competitive competition, but uh, hopefully we'll have a great turnout. A lot of samples to enjoy next Sunday, and we'll look forward to a good time. So again, the sign-up sheets are in Cyril's Hall. The Dub Project continues. Uh, we had folks turn out last Saturday, or yeah, I mean, see yesterday, and then this coming Saturday at 1145, one last time, we'll gather to make these peace doves. And then the following Sunday on the 20th, we'll display these doves in our sanctuary as our witness to peace for the world. So uh, maybe come by next Saturday and help us make a few doves. Finally, the reason I'm up here in the balcony is if you read your newsletter, we're encouraging our members, all of you, to read through the Bible in a year. And there's a reading schedule available that helps you do that. But as we're reading the scripture text, each day, there's a journal uh, suggestion that we follow. As we read our passages, we think about what scripture caught our attention, what observations do we make about the scripture text, what application can we have for our lives, and finally, we're encouraged to write a prayer. And if we follow this SOAP uh, uh, instruction, I think our readings will have much more of an impact on our lives. Now, the reason I'm up here is I have the paperwork with all the uh, scriptures for the whole year. But if you want to do this online, there is a possibility to do that. I'm going to show you how to do that. So, close this all up. So what you need to do is you go on the internet. And you type in the word E-N-E-W-H-O-P-E dot -E org. And you can see that in the address bar up in the top here. <coughs> and then when you type that in, you'll hit devotions. And you go daily devotions. And then you'll see the devotions, the readings for today. So the readings today are Genesis 15, 16, 17, and Luke 6. So you can read those online, or if you want to have those scripts read to you, at the very top, you can see this speaker right there. And if you click on the speaker, you can pull Genesis 15. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer. So even if you're driving around, if you're your laptop with you, you can uh, do that. So again, hopefully we'll make the challenge to read the Bible through the year. And I'll talk more about that in my message. But now I invite us to stand and let's greet each other in Christian love.
hear you, but you couldn't see you. Yeah, we both got a little lagged out. I'm very tired. Yeah. Yeah. Please remain standing for the call to worship and remain standing for the opening hymn. The mystery of Christ is for all nations and God's revelation for the whole human race. We come to the light of the gospel, eager to partake of its promises in Jesus Christ. The stewardship of God's grace is given to us revealed to us by prophets and apostles. We are all members of one body, the church, through which God's wisdom is made known. By God's power, we are called to be ministers, to express our faith with bold confidence. We are the least of all the saints, yet God chooses us to preach the good news.
Please be seated. Now it's time for our children's message. So children come up and Dr. Althea. Thank you. Well, good morning. Well, that was a sad response. I'll try it again. Let everybody get situated. Good morning. How are you guys doing? How's this new year treating you? 2019 off to a good start? Yeah, yeah. You keeping up with your resolutions? <laughs> you are. So, do you guys know what New Year's resolutions are? Who knows what they are? Let's see a show of hands. Okay, so Jackson knows what they are. So Jackson, why don't you tell the other kids what are New Year's resolutions? The goals that you make for the new year that you do better than the last year. Ah, did you guys hear that? They're goals that you make for the new year that you do better than the last year. Okay? So that's a very good description. Now, you make those resolutions, most of us do, on like New Year's Eve or first thing New Year's Day. And um, I'm just wondering how many of us made resolutions and have actually kept them until January 6th. Hmm. See, you don't see very many hands. Because oftentimes people make resolutions to do and set goals to do what they did <clears throat> last year better this year. But as soon as they make a little stumble, they give up. So I didn't keep it. Oh, well, I can't do it. So is that a good attitude to have, you guys? If you fail the first time, should you just I'm like, oh, well, I can't do it and give up. Is that a good way to go? No, it's not. It should be like, stick to it. So what should you do if at first you don't succeed? What do you do next? You guys ever heard the phrase, you try, and then you try again? So the great thing about New Year's is that it gives us a fresh start at a whole new year, but it also gives us a chance to think about some of the things that we did in the last year that we maybe might not want to do, or some of the things we did last year that we might want to do even more of and better. So even as kids, you guys can think of some of the things that you can do better. Like, how many of you are super duper good at cleaning up your rooms? <laughs> let, me, let me make sure your parents can see so they can mark that down, take a picture, and, you know, pull it out when they need it. Okay, so how many of you are super good at helping take care of your siblings, your brothers, your sisters? You're super good at that. Okay. So, how many of you are super good at being good listeners at school and at Sunday school? I don't know, Miss Kim. <laughs> okay. So, we can see by the show of hands that there may be an area or two in which we as kids can work on and improve on in 2019. So, I want a helpful suggestion about how we can do that. Like for instance, if one of our problems is we're not super great at cleaning up our room, um, somebody who's super great at cleaning up their room, give us a suggestion. Okay, well, Jackson, you told us before, we're gonna let Josie tell us now. Okay, Josie, what's our super duper suggestion? Okay, we're gonna let you think about it and tell us downstairs. Okay, Jackson, what's your super duper cleanup suggestion? Then and then you'll, and then you'll get better at it. Okay, clean up more often, then you'll get better at it. That's a good idea. And that's probably a good suggestion for all the things that we might need to work on, even us adults. If we try harder, if we do it more often, we'll get better at it. Like for instance, a lot of us struggle with 
reading our Bibles and understanding and making time for worship and prayer, even as kids. And so this year, we're going to walk through the Bible together. We have a, a daily study plan that we as a church are going to do together. Now, you guys aren't old enough to pick up the Bible and read it and understand it the way the adults do, but there's so much in the Bible for you guys, too. And so I want you guys, when your parents and your grandparents are studying their plan, for you to actually just get out your storybook Bibles or your Bibles that you got for, for Easter this past year and read with them so that the more we do it, the better at it we get. Are we going to try and do that? Because all of you that are part of our congregation have that. And so we want to make you part of this effort, too. So let's pray. Dear God, thank you for 2019. Thank you for 2019. Help us to try to love more, to care more, to share more, and learn more about you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, let's go power up. Would you please remain seated for the prayers of the people? followed by a period of silent meditation and the Lord's Prayer. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with a song. Lord, we thank you for having brought us safely through the night and to the beginning of this day. May our hearts and minds be open to your message through music and the spoken word. There are those among us and others who are known to you who need your healing, favor, and mercy. We think of those on our list of prayer concerns and especially those who were recently added. We remember those who have passed to the life eternal, including Puff Hampson, whose funeral was here yesterday. And may you grant to all of them holy rest and peace at last. Assist all who minister or attend to those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, and any other adversity, that they may be restored to health of body and peace of mind. Protect our men and women in uniform, police, firefighters and first responders throughout the world. Keep them safe and bring them home to their families and a grateful nation. As this new year commences, let us remember the past year. Middle East, Middle East tensions and the forever war continue. We now face a partial government shutdown fueled by tweet storms and deep partisan divisions. We are constantly reminded of opioid addiction and the deaths of migrant children. But we are uplifted by the recently concluded advent by candlelight and bell ringing for the Salvation Army, which combined raised over $12,000 for these most worthy charities. Help us to put aside anxiety about the future and regret of the past. Forgive us for the promises and resolutions made and never fulfilled. Enable us to realize our mistakes and shortcomings and make amends. We ask you to bless our families and our world as we begin this new year with a renewed hope in you. And at this time, please bring your individual requests or expressions of thankfulness to the Lord in a period of silent meditation.
And now I ask you to join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, friends, we continue our worship with a presentation of our gifts, our offerings, and I ask our ushers to come now and to receive those gifts.
what we have received from your hand. Our scripture lesson for today is taken from the first book of the Bible and opens with one of the most famous first lines of any literary work. The author of Genesis describes the one and only true God who by a series of royal creation decrees calls into being the ordered world. Although everything else at a beginning, God has always been. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. This is the will of God for the people of God. Thank you, Jim. Just a word about our first hymn this morning, uh, the first Noel. We associate that with Christmas, and you think, gosh, David, Christmas, gosh, that was a long time ago. Well, actually, that was 13 days ago. Uh, so yesterday was the 12th day of Christmas, and I shared last Sunday that uh, there's a season of Christmas, and that runs 12 days from Christmas until January the 5th. And today, believe it or not, is a new season in the church year. Today is Epiphany. And you might talk to neighbors or others, and in their churches, there'll be a focus on Epiphany and the scripture text for Epiphany and the theme many churches lift up is the visitation of the wise men to the stable. In fact, in some communities, especially Hispanic communities, this is a big day. It's the festival of the wise men. And they rejoice in the gifts that were brought by the wise men to the Christ child. And so in those cultures, there's a day of gift giving on Epiphany. Now, you think of the word Epiphany, you might think of a light goes on, right? You have an insight, an inspiration. Well, how that applies to the Christian faith is the wise men were non-Jews. They were from afar. But even they recognized the holiness, the divine of Christ. So Epiphany represents the, the light of Christ 
being shown throughout the whole world, and not just to the Jews, but all the world, recognizing God in Christ and the difference that makes in one's life. Not just for those wise men many years ago, but even today. So again, if you're talking to friends and they talk about their church experience and how they focus on epiphany, you think, well, we really didn't focus on that this morning. Well, we did. So uh, there you go. So uh, a little education on our Christian calendar and epiphany. But let's pause in a moment of prayer. And now, Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, as we begin this new year, I thought we'd have some fun this morning, have a challenge for all of you. I'm going to share with you uh, some opening lines of some best-selling books to see if you can pick what book that opening line corresponds to. I know you're all well-read, but we're going to give you some help here. So these are the titles, at least some of the titles, of these books that I'm going to read in opening lines and see if you can guess which book the line corresponds to. Does that make sense, what we're doing? Okay, good. So, start off with, it was the worst of times, the tale to so Wow, that was good. Who did that? Was that very good? Charles Dickens, and over 200 million copies uh, were sold of that book. So here we go, next one. When Mr. Bilbo Baggins of Big N announced that he would shortly be celebrating his 111st birthday, and a party of special magnificence there was much talk and excitement in Hobbit Town. <coughs> Said the Hobbit, well, wah, wah, it is the Lord of the Rings by J.R. Tolkien, and that has sold over 150 million copies. What's that? <laughs> yeah, Trig, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, a different genre of book here. So, in the corner of a first-class smoking carriage, Mr. Justice Wargrove, lately retired from the bench, puffed at his cigar and ran an interesting eye through the political news in the Times. What's that? Merton, up. Oh, that's not right. Same author, but a uh, different book. And Then There Were None by Agatha Christie. And over 100 million copies were sold. That's up there, right? Yeah, there it is. So we're throwing you off a little bit here. So uh, let's do a couple more, okay? So here's another one. Robert Langdon awoke slowly. A telephone was ringing in the darkness. A tinny, unfamiliar ring. What do you think that is? Da Vinci Code. So it is the Da Vinci Code by Dan Brown. 80 million copies of that sold. Another book, an older book. Uh, if you really want to hear about it, the first thing you'll probably want to know is where I was born and what my lousy childhood was like and how my parents were occupied and all before they had me and all the dot David Copperfield kind of crap. But I don't feel like going into it if you want to know the truth. Catcher in the Rye, that's right. J.D. Selinger, 65 million copies. And more recently, and uh, young people might know this, Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four Privet Drive were proud to say that they were perfectly normal. Thank you very much. Harry Potter, uh, practice J.K. Rowling, about 25 million. But as I researched this, all of her books, those seven books she wrote, have sold over 50, or 500 million copies. So pretty astonishing. Well, finally, in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was formless, and void, and darkness covered the face of the earth, while a wind from God swept over the face of the water. Yes, the Bible it is by far and away the most sold book ever written. And there's no way, really, to track how many copies have been printed of the Bible, because it's been printed in multiple languages, multiple countries. There's no way to keep track. And I would venture that everyone here has at least one copy of the Bible in your home. And if you don't have a copy of the Bible in your home, talk to me after the service and I'll get you a copy of the Bible. Because it's very important. Because it informs us about God and God's relationships with creation. And as you've heard, I'm encouraging our congregation to read through the Bible in the year. And again, there's a schedule to follow. It's out here on the table and every day there's readings. And as I showed you online, you can go and pull up the readings. And you can listen to the readings. Just a little heads up, though. If you're listening to the readings, 
It will just continue chapter after chapter after chapter. It won't stop with the number of verses set for that day. So you have to know. So for today, Genesis ends like chapter, say, 20. So after chapter 20, you have to stop it physically and then move on to the rest of your readings. So I'm encouraging you to do that. And again, to help us read through the Bible in the year, every Sunday, I'll be preaching on a scripture text that comes from the prior week's readings. So again, if you're following along, you'll know that I'll be touching upon something that you have read in the previous week. And the other thing I wrote about in the newsletter, and this is very important, if you decide to do the reading plan, make it a resolution. But like many resolutions, we don't stay true, and we may break that resolution, and we skip a day or two. And that might happen. It probably will happen. It happens to me when I do it, I confess. But if you do miss a day or two, don't try to go back and pick up all those readings. Because if you do, it seems overwhelming to read all that. So just consider, okay, I'm going to move on and pick up today and read the lessons for today and reflect on those scripture lessons for today. So if you can do that, I think it would be helpful. But you might be wondering, why should we do this? Why take up this task of reading through the Bible in a year? I mean, the Bible is confusing at places. It's disturbing in other places. And it's just plain antiquated. It's history. I mean, this stuff happened a long time ago. So why in the world should I read the Bible? Well, I agree with you about it's antiquated, maybe. Not necessarily antiquated, but it's confusing and disturbing. But still, the Bible is the lens. It's the lens through which we are helped to better understand God. Now, if you've ever used a lens on a camera, you know that you can adjust the lens. And as you're adjusting the lens, sometimes things are blurry and sometimes they're clear, in and out, in and out. And as you read through the Bible, you'll find at times things get a little blurry, a little troubling as you're reading through the Bible. But if we stick with it, in between the blurriness, we do get some clarity, some clarity about who God is and what God is all about with creation and with us. So I think it's helpful for us to read through this lens, through the Bible, because to realize that this is the lens, the Bible, through which a multitude of people in different times, in different places, in different cultures, have gained a clear picture of God. Now I believe as one reads through the Bible, one gains an appreciation, not only the power of God, and you read the Bible, you see how powerful God is. But besides the power of God, you get an appreciation for the love of God. The love that God has for all of creation, and especially for humanity. Now another term that we could use for the Bible is God's story. This is God's story. For it contains the story of how God came to be in relationship with humanity. First it was to a select group of people called the Jews, and then that relationship spread out to everyone else. But let's go out back to that first all-important part of the Bible, the beginning in Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's the power of God, right? And the earth was formless. It was dark. Cover the earth. But then it says a wind, right? A wind swept over the face of the waters. And what did God do? God said, let there be light. And what happened? There was light. Power of God. And God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from darkness, and he called the light day, and the darkness he called night. There was evening, there was day, the first day. Well, those are amazing words. Powerful words. They're poetry. It suggests an orderly form, an orally concept of God. It suggests that God is powerful, that God is good. So God's story begins with creation. It presents God as the author of life, and the culmination, if you read through Genesis 1, the culmination of all that creation is the creation of humankind, of male and female. But if you read through Genesis, what does it say about humankind? It says that we will be created in God's image that humanity will be responsible for every living creature. And then after all humans were created, 
God said they were very good. Now, if we think of the Bible as a story, then the beginning of Genesis is the introduction. The stage is set. It is planet Earth. And the main characters will be God and humanity, and the plot will evolve the relationship between those characters, the relationship between God and humanity, or more specifically, between God and us. That's right, I said us. Because even though the Bible was written a long time ago, we're included in the narrative. Because we're part of creation. We're part of humanity. So the Bible is really a story about God and us. Now, unlike most stories that end at a conclusion, at the end of the book, God's story continues. Because don't we believe that God is still work in creation? But though God is the author of life, the story actually is uncertain of how it will end. Because unlike most authors that have a plot already planned out, so when you start a novel, you know how it's going to end. To be truthful, God leaves the story open-ended, right? God leaves it to us, you and I, to write the story. That's a lot of faith on God's part, right? Relies on us to fill in the rest of the story. Because we're never forced, right, to do anything. I mean, God gives us some clues in our Bible how we should treat God and how we should treat others, but we're never forced to do anything. It's our choices. So how are we going to write the story that's the question I asked us to ponder this morning. What chapters are we writing? And if we see ourselves as co-authors with God, then that puts more of an importance on what we're doing with our lives. And does knowing that God considered creation good and God considers other humans very good, does that impact the choices that we make? So, friend, God's story is fantastic. It's beginning in the beginning, is more powerful than any bestseller. But what about the conclusion of that story? Now, we all enjoy a, a story with a happy ending, don't we? In fact, I just saw, this side note, I just saw over the weekend, uh, Vice, the movie Vice, if you've seen it. It's an interesting movie, but it doesn't really end with a happy ending. So we like stories that have happy endings. Well, what can you and I do to increase the potential for a happy ending to God's story. Maybe it's becoming closer to God, and I believe reading the Bible through the year will help us get closer to God. Or maybe it might be taking better care of ourselves and creation, or how about respecting and caring for others? Friends, whether you choose to decide to read through the Bible or not, I believe that our focus, as Franklin Community Church, our focus on the Bible this coming year, I believe that will bring revival to our church. I believe will have an impact on our faith community. Because how can it not? We're reading God's words, and God's words are powerful. Now, in school, back in the day when we were in school, we'd get these reading assignments, right? And when you'd have your reading assignment, you'd go back to class, and guess what? There was a test. There was a paper you had to write because of those reading assignments. Well, friends, we're not going to test you on whether you're reading or not, because it's not mandatory. But again, I guarantee you that if you make the effort as many days as you can to read through that schedule, that your life will be changed. It will be changed. And hopefully, at the end of this year, we'll have a clear, more focused image, understanding of who God is, God's power, and God's love. So we have those wonderful words of life. Are we going to read them or not? Let us pray. Oh, gracious, loving God, we do begin this new year. And as Althea said, that many times we challenge ourselves to do some things differently, maybe to improve ourselves, improve the world. And this is just one suggestion, to read through this holy book of yours. And as we do this God story, maybe through this lens, we will have a greater appreciation and insight into just powerful you are, but you don't abuse that power, but you share it. You love us, and that can make all the difference in the world. So encourage us and challenge us, O oh Lord, we pray. Amen. Well, in the Bible, in the New Testament, we read about Jesus and his journey, and uh, just before his life ends, 
he gathers with his closest friends in an upper room. And in that upper room, he shares his Last Supper. But not only did he share his Last Supper with his friends, there in that upper room, he instituted, he initiated a holy meal whereby any of his followers who would come after him, when they would partake of the bread and the juice, they would be able to be sustained by Christ's own spirit. So today, the first Sunday of the month, we continue this practice of Holy Communion and we'll share in the consecration of the elements and then you'll be invited to come up and receive by intinction, which means you'll come up and there'll be a piece of bread and I'll be holding the gluten-free bread and Jim will have the regular bread and you'll come, you'll dip the bread into the juice and you'll receive your communion. And if you'd like to kneel at the railing for a few moments after receiving communion, the railing is open to you and then you'll go back to your seats. And then finally, we practice an open table, which means that anyone is invited to come and to receive God's grace through their bread and juice. But now we prepare ourselves for the great thanksgiving. Christ invites to this table all who are ready to move beyond the limitations of the past. Christ invites to this table all who are eager to move into the new thing that God is doing in our midst. Christ invites to this table all who are willing to, to let go of the pain that's gone. And so this is an open invitation to come and receive the bread that will sustain us as we embark on this new calendar year. All are invited to receive the sweetness of the cup as a sign of God's promise of abundant possibilities. All are invited to this meal for all are forgiven their past regrets and invited into God's grace-filled future. Praise to the living God. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts this new day. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, creator and redeemer of all life. Time and again we seek us, time and again you seek us out, breathing again the breath of life into deflated places of our lives. And so we come to your table again to praise you and to taste you again, to taste again what your steadfast love can do. Holy are you.